Greetings, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about an implementation for a round robin switch. So what are we talking about? Basically, we have a situation where we have some kind of parameter that has multiple settings, a modest number, three, four, five, something like that. And we just want to cycle through them. For example, you might have a heat pump. And there's a couple of different operation modes. Right? You could have this in, uh, in a heating mode. And, you know, I'll press a button. And it'll go from heat mode to cool mode. Press another button. Or, excuse me, press it again. Um, and that might go into uh, dehumidify mode. Press it again, and maybe it goes into fan only mode. So we basically hit this button, cycle through it. When I get to fan, I hit it again, it goes back to heat, right? So it's cycling through this thing, okay? Now, what we're going to look at here as far as code is going to assume that we have a debound switch. I'm not going to worry about that. And secondly, for no particular reason, um, we're also going to say that we're looking at a low to high transition. Right, you could code this in the opposite way. But I'm just going to use low to high, just for fun. All right, so what do we need to do this? So the first thing we need is a state variable. In other words, to indicate our current operation mode. Are we in heat mode, cool mode, etc.? Now, typically, that would either be a global or it might be a static variable. Because we're going to need this to sort of remember where we are, right? So I don't want an auto class variable that sort of, uh, you know, forgets when we exit a function. Okay, so in our case, uh, something like this, um, you know, we might have something, I'll just call it like this, unsigned character. Right, you know, I, I don't need a big uh, variable here. I only have a, a handful of states. So maybe I'll just call that G state. I always like to start my globals with the letter G. Right, just so I know when I look at them, oh, that's a global. And I'll just initialize that at zero. How many states do I have? Well, I'll probably use a, uh, a symbol for that. I'll do a pound define. And uh, in this case, we'll just say, well, there's max states. That's an M. Max states is uh, four. All right. I have two big options here. I, you can either do an interrupt-based version or we can do a non-interrupt-based version. All depends on what you're looking, looking for here. Um, in this particular case, an interrupt-based version um, would be pretty straightforward to implement. So for example, we could use a pin change interrupt. So what would we have to do here? Well, um, in the setup, we would have to, of course, enable the interrupts, right? The appropriate bank and pin. And then, once that's done, we would have to write the ISR, the interrupt service routine. And it turns out that that's fairly straightforward, right? So we would simply have, in this case, an ISR. And I'm going to write this kind of generically. I'm just going to call this PC int x, you know, PC int 0, 1, 2, and depending. I'm just going to call it x vector. And all we have to do, now remember, this uh, pin change is going to give us um, a call to our ISR whenever there's a change in the pin. In other words, a high to low or a low to high transition. Now, in our case, I'm just going to look for this low to high transition. 
So what I'm going to do is look at the appropriate port that matches this, and I'm just going to call that port X. Right, I'm just trying to keep things generic here. So, you know, port D, port B, whatever you're using. I'm just going to call it port X. And uh, since I'm looking for a load of high, um, I'm going to check to see if uh, port X ended with the bit mask, whatever that happens to be. And again, I'll just generically refer to that as mask, right? If that result is high. And if this is high, then we must have had a low to high transition. So what do I do? Well, we simply increment the variable that we're using, right? This, this thing over here called G state, I just increment it. Ready? Now, the only thing I have to worry about is going beyond, right? So if we were in fan and I hit it again, I need to flip it back to heat. So basically that's going to be zero, one, two, three. So if we've sort of bumped this beyond the range, right? If G state is equal to or greater than, right? The max states, and this is one of these reasons we use a, a symbolic constant here, is, you know, if in the future, if I change this, I just have to change you know, this number, if I come up with a fifth state, a sixth state, I just change it here. I don't have to go through my code and find all the instances of that. Okay, so if, if that's the case, then just reset it back to zero. Alrighty. So that takes care of the if. Boom, we're done. Now what ends up happening is back in our loop or you know whatever other code we're, we're calling we simply access that variable as needed and you know we update some leds we uh you know do whatever is required for this particular thing okay but that's how we implement it so it just runs around i just have this simple uh, variable that holds that okay now a non-interrupt There's a little bit of a trick here. The issue is that if, if you're doing this, let's say inside loop, right, the loop function, um, that button that you're depressing, that thing could be checked literally thousands of times in a single second. So you can't just C is the button down, kind of like what we did here. You can't just do that because, you know, a person comes in and they hit the button, and even though they only sort of depress it once, that could be called or checked you know, hundreds or thousands of times. So, you know, what would end up happening is this thing would cycle through, you know, like a 152 times, and it's almost random in terms of, you know, where it's going to wind up in one of those four states. So we still have to look for this low to high transition, right? We still have to kind of focus on this. How do we find that bit? Well, what we do is we have to keep track of the prior value of the button. Was it depressed or not? Okay, so I'm going to come up with another variable here. And again, this only needs to, to check is or is not. So this is just a character. And uh, again, this is going to be a global. I'm going to call this prior button. What was it before? So by calling it zero, I'm implying that the prior state was low. All right. OK, so now I'm going to write my loop function. but you know, this, what I'm going to write, of course, could be in a function that is called by loop. But just to keep it simple, right, we have our loop function over here. That should be a lowercase l. All right, so I need a, um, a variable for the current value of button. In other words, the current state of button. So I'm going to create this new variable. 
Again, this is going to be an unsigned character. And I am just going to call this button. So the first thing I do is I check, kind of like we did over here, what is button? All right, this is either going to give me a true or a false. All right, it's not going to give me zero and one because it all depends on what bit we're looking at, right? Zero and non-zero. Remember, that's really what false and true represent. Zero is false. Non-zero, in other words, exists, is true. So I take a look at port X, whatever port I'm using, and that with the appropriate bit mask, just like we did before, right? So if it's depressed, then button is going to be non-zero. It's going to be high. So, if current value of button is greater than the prior button, which was zero, then we know this must be a low to high transition. There's other ways you could word this, but this is a simple way to do it, right? So I have a low to high transition. What do I do? Well, basically the same thing I did before. In other words, increment G state, check to see if G state's out of bounds. Like we did before. If it is, you know, reset it, cycle it back to zero. Now, when you're done with that, we need to set up for the next time around. So update the prior button to its current value. So the next time through, prior button reflects where we are right now. Right? Because the next time around, where we are now is going to be the past. Then, down in here, you know, we do whatever other stuff we need to do. And that's the end of our loop function. So the first time, when this thing starts up, right, prior button zero. And let's just say that the person doesn't have their finger on the button yet. So button comes up as zero. So button's not greater than prior button. It's the same. And we just... You know, take the current value, which is zero, and we overwrite this, which is zero. So nothing's really changed. Eventually, person's going to press the button, and button's going to be high. So button will be greater than prior button. Increment, check for the, you know, the uh, overflow. Initially, there won't be because, you know, G state will start off at zero. So that goes up to one. Then we copy over the current value of button to prior button. So the next time through, right, so the person's finger is still on the button. Okay, so, you know, here we are a millisecond later. Person's finger still on the button. Comes through, button is high, but is it greater than prior button? No, they're the same value. So this doesn't happen. All right, we just copy over the prior button. So it's one again. Eventually they take their finger off the button. And when that happens, we're going to have a low here. Okay, it's not going to be greater. So nothing happens other than this. Prior button now goes to zero. Next time through the loop, right? It's probably still going to be zero, zero, zero. Nothing happens. Eventually, the person's going to press the button again, and this is going to go high. So this will be true. We'll have a low to high transition. We'll increment so that one will now go to a two. And guess what? G button, the prior button gets set to the current value. So that's also high, and we have the same thing iterating over and over and over again. Eventually, after several presses, right, G state will increment up, in our case, to four. So we're greater than or equal to max states. That gets popped back down to zero, and the whole process starts all over again. There you go. Round robin switch. The next thing is how do we get the button to automatically increment? So, you know, I've got a button over here, you know, uh, to cycle through these things. 
here's the button. You know, usually it has some sort of uh, incongruous little um, icon on it. You know, some crazy looking thing. Um, so the user comes in here and they press the button. Great. Well, what if you have a situation where there's not like three or four or five, but you get a big thing. You got like a hundred things, you know, like you're setting a volume control, for example, or maybe a temperature, right? You know, a temperature, you're going by maybe degrees. You could have a pretty wide range of temperatures and you don't want to sit there and go. You know, that's no fun. You got to do that a hundred times. You know, what we would like to do is an auto increment. I'd like to be able to just press the button and then after, you know, maybe a little delay, have this thing automatically increment faster than what I can do by hand, right? Faster than that. So it's going to and I just keep my finger on the button, right? Take it off and it stops. And then I can go back to singles if I need to, right? An auto increment. That's the next thing we're going to look at. 